You wake up in the morning and look at the ceiling of your room. You ruffle in your sheets as you begin to climb out of bed. You start to begin your daily routine. And after you finish, you step out the door and your wired perspective takes hold as you venture out. Society's conveyor belt keeps us on a course of tunnel vision, not examining the perspectives of others as we feel ours and those close to us matter. We assume the experiences of others are similar to ours and ignorance formulates. We are going to show you multiple perspectives and what these people have endured in the past. Many of us fail to acknowledge the wrongs that have occurred to many or we simply think that enough has been done and no further work is needed. Times are changing and we are realizing that those around us come from all walks of life and from those walks have shaped who they are today. By acknowledging these past perspectives, efforts are being made to ameliorate the past and pave the way for the future. So when I first came to the University of Michigan, I came as a summer bridge kid um, way back in the early 90s, 1991 to be exact. And so coming in, didn't know how to navigate the university. Um, and one of the things that I didn't do a very good job of when I was a student is I didn't uh, learn about resources and I didn't learn how to use resources. You so know, I even didn't. now when I enter different settings, you look around and scan the room. And again, I'm usually the only person of color, much less black. And you find yourself just thinking, okay. It was after I got my PhD that I said to myself, okay, now I have to really start my education. I had tried during my education to broaden my horizons and meet people from different backgrounds, but the content of my classes was so limited. Being a city student was so different from being up here where you're literally cloistered on this campus. Well, so a couple of things that you want to know about um, being a person of color in this space um, is that there's just not a lot of people of color. I was a student employee for three years when I worked in Michigan Dining. I came from a very homogenous community and uh, interacting with people of different identities was not something that I understood right away. When I was a young girl, you didn't hear much about people going to college. And so coming from an under, as an undergrad, I really was clueless about college. By sharing our stories, we realize we are much more similar than different. And by sharing, we gain imperative knowledge and perspective. And along the way, engage in an accurate and updated view of the world. Some of these views upon arriving at universities are insignificant to some and relatable to others, but they all hold a story that has led them to be the individuals they are today and how they overcame their obstacles then and now. So when I got my PhD and I decided I was going to come back to the University of Michigan, I, ve I was very specific because I said I wanted to come work for CSP if I was ever going to work because all of the things that I should have taken advantage of and should have known about, I wanted to make sure that the current student populations know about those things. It's a lot of people here and you have to find your way. Our world is rich with different people, different experiences, different ways of knowing. Uh, different ways of seeing things, and the opportunity to embrace that, uh, both on an intellectual level and on a personal and social level, is what the humanity is about. I want to try to show that not only am I worth worthy of being in the space, but I have something really valuable to offer. So um, my navigation now is really about helping students navigate in ways that I didn't know how to navigate as a, as a incoming student. Uh, within dining, what I found was a lot of opportunity to kind of hear other people's stories and had to do a lot of my own growth and get a lot of support in trying to understand those stories. But I wanted more for myself. I wanted to work hard, but I wanted to ensure that I would not have to work hard in a physical way. Right. And so I think that's something that's 
that I always try to stress to people is to take advantage of the resources. Actor Sterling Brown once said, Empathy begins with understanding life from another person's perspective. Nobody has an objective experience of reality. It's all through our own individual prisms. We are all the product of our collective environments and the array of viewpoints represented in institutions of higher learning often become distinct and colorful when we leave our silos and are forced to look at life through another lens. To show a sampling of such richness, we asked Dr. Harold Waters and Dr. Charlotte Winston of the Comprehensive Studies Program and Elizabeth James of the Department of Afro-American and African Studies about how their personal experiences as undergraduates help them better understand what more is needed for educational institutions to service people from all walks of life. And so coming from an under, as an undergrad, I really was clueless about college, you know, being a first generation student. Um, I was also a lower SES student, came from the city of Detroit. No one in my family really did college. Um, and now that I am a professional here at the university, I've navigated college. I've navigated, you know, the undergraduate experience, the graduate experience, the PhD experience. Yeah. But so once I got here, I started to see what she meant about how even though Michigan was in the North, there were these subtle racist issues that I had to try to figure out. When so, I was a young girl, you didn't hear much about people going to college. It was usually the case that once you graduated high school, you were able to go out into the workforce and get a decent paying job. But I wanted more for myself. I wanted to work hard, but I wanted to ensure that I would not have to work hard in a physical way. So college has always been attractive to me, but um, eventually I made my way to college as a non-traditional student. So once I entered the college setting, I was already a wife, I was already a mother. And so I think um, with that, being a non-traditional student came a certain level of maturity. While focusing solely on our academic and extracurricular worlds and on ephemeral tasks, we shut ourselves out from the bigger picture. We forget the power of the heart, the strength of family, and the importance of treasuring others' lives. We need to take a moment to reflect on what really is at stake and ask ourselves what really needs to be done. I think that we have made improvements, of course, um, but most definitely, yeah, there are some, some biases and, um, that are still in place. I think there's still a lot of latent ways in which we kind of restrict students though. Whether it's a manifest or latent type of thing, like okay it's clearly shown or explicitly stated, especially um, when you think of okay how do we make students feel as though they are a part? How do they make, how do we make students feel, you know, comfortable in whatever setting they are part of. And talking right? with people and going on study abroad, all of that really helps you to see how even here is very broad and you just keep growing and growing and all of this. You know what? You all know a lot here, but there's so much more. Because of that, we always want to be conscious of the community that we build, not only to make students feel more welcome when they come to work for us uh, and make that a positive experience, but also not have anyone feel as if they're being pushed into uh, a part of campus that they, they don't want to be in, that no one likes them, right? Really, our statement on inclusivity reflects uh, the values that we have towards making an environment for our staff that uh, everyone wants to be a part of and everyone can be a part of. At the heart of it, though, is really that we want to create an experience for our employees and for our diners that allows them to be their full selves in our spaces. It's, it's not so much just can you express yourself and be your full self, but is everyone in the space in a place where you can feel included for doing that or where you can feel uh, that you're not getting sidelong glances or microaggressions essentially for, for the way that you, you present. One of the biggest problems with the university today is that too many people don't trust students. There's not a sense of trust of young people in general in our society. And I think this is really misguided and really wrong. 
And Optimize is a place that sort of turns the tables and says, we trust students. And also the only way to make someone trustworthy is to trust them. In society, most of us are moving along with the motions, not questioning the ideas that have been shown to us for so long. In a sense, we are on a conveyor belt that is facilitating century-old ideologies. However, some of us are making steps to, to move away from our fixed mindsets and are trying to make real change in society. Individuals, Professor Schoen, Joe Cooling, and Jeff Sorensen are doing this because they have learned and reflected from the perspectives of the past and now they are advocating for change in the present. The conveyor belt is, this is Beverly Tatum, Beverly Daniel Tatum's idea. It's from her book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations on Race. So he talks about how we live our lives of privilege and unless we actively work against the privilege in society, that even if we are opposed to it or find it problematic, we're actually contributing to the continuation, the sustaining of the systems of privilege. And so she gives the example of walking on an airport conveyor belt, a walking sidewalk. And most people of privilege, they're not meaning to do any harm, they're just walking. What could be you know, more harmless than that? And yet it sustains the systems in society and to actively stand against racism and sexism and other forms of oppression, uh, you actually have to sort of go against that, that conveyor belt of movement. And so how would you do that? You might jump over the conveyor belt. And of course, to do all those things is sort of dangerous. If police saw you jumping, people might just get very disturbed and excited and riled up. And, uh, or who knows, you might get arrested. But uh, it takes courage and it takes intentionality to say, I'm going to stand up for what's right and I'm going to try to really change the system and not just go with the flow. Because just going with the flow and trying to be a nice person, you're just doing more to sustain those systems than you are to, to change them. Yeah, so we, we talk about, uh, in our training for our student coordinators, we talk about the cultural iceberg. Uh, if you're not familiar with the, the concept, essentially it's that when we view culture and expressions of culture, we have some that are above the iceberg, things like, you know, food, dress, festivals, things of that we can, we think we can see very clearly in someone's identities, but we also have uh, things below the iceberg uh, that maybe don't come out so immediately, or uh, maybe something that you have to kind of fish out through either uh, making a faux pas or um, having more direct relationship interactions with others. And uh, we talk about the iceberg mainly because there are a lot of assumptions that we tend to make about what might be below the iceberg. Uh, and when we talk about this with our student coordinators, it's to try to help them challenge the biases that they have uh, and really think deeply about when I'm working with one of my students or when I'm working with a staff member, what are the assumptions that I'm making? What are the stories that I'm telling myself? And how can I either just be aware of them is kind of the first step uh, and kind of work some more, I don't know, address them more directly with themselves through reflection. I think across the university, far too many people have you know contempt or even disdain for students especially undergraduate students people think you know that that you're not worthy of their time or of their attention and or that you know students can't change anything or that that you have to wait until you're older and have more degrees to actually make an impact and it's extremely harmful to the learning environment here on campus if people don't believe in the potential of students. But second of all, it's just missing a huge opportunity because what we've seen over seven years of doing Optimize is that undergraduate students, even first year freshman students, can make a huge impact with the projects that they're working on. 
this program shows a lot that we believe students can change the world and no matter how many people doubt that young people have the potential to make change, this is a place that really believes in students and believes in young people. A lot of people in the world are going to be telling you all the reasons you can't do something. You're too young, or you don't know enough, or you don't have enough experience, or, or whatever the excuse might be. Optimize is always going to be a place where you can come and there's going to be a lot of people telling you that yes, you can do this. It is the responsibility of our generation to commit to looking towards a future where we engage in dialogue amongst each other, to cultivate genuine human beings, and to listen, accept, reflect, and act on the realities of society. We can start by listening to the voices of experience who will provide us with a toolkit to step back and see the resounding beauty of our communities and lives. Yeah. It's easy to stay in a safe space, but I think to be brave, you've got to kind of step out a little. But if you have a multitude of different voices, you start to build a choir and you have harmony and you have, you have some of those moments where there is a clash, but from that clash, you can learn a lot. It's important that we have students from every background and every culture and every economic status here because mm. without that, you know, true education isn't really happening. And we have much better perspective taking when we're in diverse settings. That if we're just around people who are, who are like us, who've grown up in the same backgrounds, racially, religion, culturally, socioeconomically, and so on, we're just reinforcing each other's ideas you can find ways to work together and really kind of create bridges because they, that's where the hard work is. You know. A common proverb instructs that we should always leave the spaces we occupy better than we found them. It is the hope that this university will remain steadfast in its commitment to cultivating victors who represent all that it means to be the leaders and best. In the same breath, we must be genuine in recognizing that intentionality and proactive initiatives are critical in making sure that the plight towards equity is continuous as demographics are ever changing. Consequently, we asked CSP Director Dr. Harold Waters about how CSP, a vital organ of this university, will enhance the institution in the time to come. I think our role is to provide students um, the landscape to thrive. So from my perspective, our job is not to make students graduate. It is to provide um, the toolkits needed for students to navigate this very complex university system and help them get totally immersed in the educational experience so that when they are done with this Michigan degree, they feel like they are gotten everything out of the University of Michigan that they could. We have kind of this strategic plan that we are actually working on. So we have a five-year vision. And what that vision is, is for CSP. Um, so right now we're an office, we're a program. And what we would like to move CSP is from the programmatic stage to the center stage. So instead of us being the comprehensive studies program, we want to be the academic success center. Um, which means a more robust uh, focus in on the experience of the students that goes beyond the academics, but we're thinking about curricular and co-curricular. So the goal is that CSP is the national model for how to help students succeed at a place like University of Michigan. So when you, when you read about student success, when you read about um, student graduation, students thriving, students matriculating, when you read about underrepresented student experiences at University of Michigan, whether it's a first generation student or underrepresented minority student, when you read about those nationally, the first thing that people think about is the University of Michigan. And when you talk about it at the University of Michigan, the things that people think about are CSP. So the CSP becomes the national model. So that's where we're going. We saw multiple perspectives examining the past, present, and the future. We have learned the following. Empathy has taught us to look through the eyes of others and how their journeys have shaped them. We have seen how efforts today prepare us for our complex changing world. Finally, we have been taught how to leave places better off than when we first saw them. My question to all of you is, what do we do with this information? 
Do we forget about it in a week? Because we are too occupied with our own lives? Do we wait on others to lead the way for us? Or do we put forth the time and effort to make sure the world keeps on changing towards a positive direction? My answer to you is to lead the way for the future. Do not let the spark of change extinguish within you. Instead, pass it on to others, to your children, your friends, anyone that you can tell. Until we realize that all of us harbor unique perspectives and that that is what shapes us, who we become, we may finally live in a world in which we understand each other and can finally work towards real progress in our world. We can't change the world by ourselves, but in seeing the lives of others, then we can foster change. I will leave you with a quote by the Dalai Lama. People take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. Just because they are not on your road does not mean they are lost. By simply listening to the past and reflecting on the experiences of others, we realize what needs to be done to right our wrongs. And by seeing those who have commenced their plan of actions, we should feel inspired to do the same because the benefits are worth the fight. Let's begin the change towards a meaningful change. And learning about other cultures and other backgrounds is such an empowering thing. The university should exist to elevate the potential of these amazing students who are here with us and, and, and the results will speak for themselves among people who maybe just don't have that same belief yet. But, but once they see the work that we're doing, they'll believe. So that's what we want to provide uh, at the be and the best universities are the ones that are teaching the stories and the narratives and the insights of all peoples. It's okay to keep working on things and that you may not see the fruit of your labor, but that doesn't mean you haven't played a crucial role. We're conditioned to think that our lives revolve around great moments, but great moments often catch us unaware, beautifully wrapped in what others may consider a small one. You've got to find your purpose. You've got to wake up before dawn and watch the sky transform itself into a beautiful shade of pink and listen to the birds come alive. You've got to make yourself vulnerable and put yourself out there to make new friends. Most importantly, you've got to stop letting the things that won't matter in two years matter now. You've got to stop asking others for their opinion. You've got to remember to try because the only failure is if you don't attempt to change for the better. You've got to look at yourself long and hard in the mirror and look within yourself to see your full potential.